Ah, my precious. Welcome back to TV set. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is another edition of TV set. Uh, Happy New Year. Uh, this is January 6, uh, 2013. And uh, my name is Jim Rathall, and my co host Jeff Gerritsen is with me, and my co host, the lovely Sally Steeppath. Dr. 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 Sally Steeppath. And yes, we have changed to six o'clock. It is six o'clock now. That's right. That's right. <clears throat> yes, we have. And it is a time change. And she's just given me a big tongue lashing about <clears throat> talking and enunciating and <clears throat> everything else. We want to hear, hear you. you. That's know. all. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, folks, so um, <laughs> getting back to the show. So there has been this event happening, I'm sure that it's been impossible to, to miss. It's called the Fiscal Cliff. And uh, I've noticed that so many of the, the TV journalists have called it Physical Cliff, which is wrong, wrong, wrong. And it was a Republican invention, this whole idea. So here on the set, we decided to try and stick with the, the moniker the congressional imposition, and Jeff actually came up with it, and, and I, yes. think it, I think it's an excellent moniker. So we're gonna try and avoid calling it the fiscal cliff. But, uh, <clears throat> and, and I know a lot of people are kind of relieved that we have avoided going over the fiscal cliff, whatever, whatever that might mean. Um, but uh, what was it really? What happened? What was it, after all? <clears throat> so. Um, that's going to be coming up. But right now, I wanted to talk about a very interesting piece that I saw in the New York Times by a guy named Nate Silver. <clears throat> His name may have come up in the news uh, because he was the guy that correctly uh, predicted the, uh, the, the election, the presidential election, and all the other election, all the other um, uh, congressional elections that happened at the same time and he was the only person that did it and it was quite remarkable. <clears throat> so uh, in this piece for New York Times he was talking about the changes that he is measuring uh, in the electorate and and what this might hold for uh, for uh, elections in the future. <clears throat> did, did either of you have a chance to read this? I mm -hmm. had a chance to read it and I thought the really important piece about it mm -hmm. is that these districts have become more monochrome, chromatic. That these districts more polarized. Right, that they're mm -hmm. polarized, mm -hmm. and that so there's a Tea Party district mm -hmm. or a liberal Democrat district mm -hmm. or a moderate Democrat district. Yeah, and it, it's almost as if they've been so gerrymandered that they could be the representatives for those districts can act with impunity, say anything they want, do anything they want. Say one thing regardless. here, regardless, regardless, and then just go do what they're going to do. Okay, <coughs> control room. But, but they <coughs> cannot use their own judgment. Control room, get ready mm -hmm. to, and to bring up graphic number their mind, one, or they have for everybody. The discussion right now. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, here we go. Do we have? Do we have that? Here okay, it, it, it happened just like magic. So this was one of the uh, one of the graphics that was in the New York Times piece, and blue, of course, is Democrat. Red, of course, is Republican. And yellow in the middle is what they call swing swing voters. You heard so much about swing voters, and this goes back to I believe it's like uh, nineteen. Uh, can you see Sally? 92. 92. 92. 92? Mm -hmm. And then it goes forward to twenty twelve, and you can see that the uh, the number of uh, undecided voters or the swing voters uh, is is diminishing, <clears throat> and also right. the deep blue means Democrats that are. Um, uh, completely on board with the Democratic ticket, and the lighter blue is they're a little less certain. And the mm -hmm. same thing is true for red. So as you can see, uh, as exactly as, as Sally was saying, is that uh, the, uh, the nation is becoming more polarized as it's going on. Now, <clears throat> Jeff, uh, mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit, uh, a little bit mm -hmm. more about what you were just saying about the consequence of what that might, might be for us. Why should we care about that? Well, why, why, why we should care is the, our representatives don't, they, they'll just act on their own behalf or probably on their own contributors' behalf. Okay, now why would that happen? 
why that happened, mm -hmm. because they I mean, need... To, to tell, uh, tell people, explain to folks that may be watching what the mechanism is that would cause that. The mechanism is they need so much more money now to get elected. These okay. elections have become just um, slugfests in the media. Mm -hmm. uh, this last presidential election, over $3 billion was spent. Yeah. So that's a huge number, actually. <laughs> it's for outrageous. Ages. For as little as we got out of it. It's just, well, yeah. they wanted to, yeah. to the, spend the money to, to, get, to bring people away from Obama, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it, didn't it didn't work. work. Mm -hmm. It didn't work, which was good. But anyways, what happens is when you start getting polarized like this, all of a sudden, and these, our districts are so gerrymandered mm -hmm. that our representatives can do anything they want Mm -hmm. Now, can, ex explain to people what gerrymandering means, okay, because there are a lot of people that are watching that have no idea what, okay. that, what that means. Gerrymandering is a term loosely described of rigging and adjusting your political representation or your political bound, the boundaries of your area. The geographical, such a, geographical boundary. Geographical boundaries, right. excuse me, of an area in such a way that you can almost ensure your re-election. Who does that? Oh, dear. It's... Um, Congress does what every ten years? Congress nationally. Was, there, there's some state, congressional district. State, national. States do it. Mm -hmm. I think everybody does it. Okay. Basically, who's ever in power does it. Is it legal or Ill illegal? I think it's illegal. All right. As a matter of fact, it's it's one of those things <laughs> where it's illegal, but they just go ahead and do it anyways. Okay, Sally, I got a question for you. So let's just say that that let's say Oregon. Uh, Portland, in particular, <coughs> was gerrymandered to make it even more democratic, just to favor democratic interest even more mm -hmm. than it is. Mm -hmm. Would that be a good thing or a bad thing, in your opinion? Because I know you're a Democrat. It would be you a... You ain't kidding me. I am a Democrat, but it would be a bad thing because the people who are conservative, the people who are Republican, would not be represented. Okay, that's one bad Even thing. if it's only 2% Mm -hmm. of the population, yeah. they should have some kind of representation. They should mm -hmm. be able to influence. Okay, do you, do you buy that, Jeff? And bring up their ideas. I, I, I mm -hmm. agree with you, but do you, have, do you buy that? Do you think there's any additional reason? I think I'll, in addition to that, okay. there should be a, a consistent set of boundaries drawn and then kind of left alone. Oh, I agree with that. And not changed on a yes. regular basis to favor the incumbent whoever's or whoever, in office. Who, whoever's in office. Right. But the Republicans do it and the Democrats do it, mm -hmm. whoever is in office. Okay, I, I have, I have a quote. When that 10 years comes up. I have a quote from this article that I think is very pertinent okay. to this moment. And Nate Silver says, one of the firmest conclusions of academic research into the behavior of Congress is that what motivates members first and foremost is winning elections. Yes. Status. Yes. Is, is winning no, election, not just status. getting <clears throat> elected back <throat> into the office. Right. Correct. Now, yes. <clears throat> so if, 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 if uh, Blue Portland became even bluer, so there was no chance for it to not be blue, would our Congress, congressional people be motivated to, uh, to uh, bow to the people's will? Only they would not be. They would be motivated to follow whatever the, the blue line was, mm -hmm. whatever the, the, the position of, uh, the party. of the party. Not the, the people. The party, not the people. That's a big... That's the a people would not be representative. Yeah. The idea of electing representatives to Congress is that they consider things and and look at things from both sides and they you know they become reasonable. And okay. what we have, which which everybody mm -hmm. I know is frustrated with, is mm -hmm. the fact we have a Congress that's polarized. And this, what, what this and so chart, it's, it's progressively, what this chart, can we p pull up the chart one more time, please? Mm -hmm. And so, so the politicians have become mm -hmm. less responsive to, right. to the people's needs. Yes. Because their first priority is to get reelected. Yeah. But right. they are millionaires. They're nice guys, right? Right. And million, because they're millionaires, they have status. 
Right. And so they're going to do the right thing. Wrong. <laughs> They'll do whatever they have to do to get elected. Okay, do we have that, that graphic one more time <clears throat> that we could take a look at? Okay, okay, can we look at it a little closer? Bigger. My, or do I need to put, do I need to bring on in my binoculars so I can look at that thing? <laughs> They're working on it. Okay. okay. Well, we, They're working we're going to have a, a big one in just a moment. Anyway. Okay. Now we have a big one. There you go. Thank Good. you. Okay. What were you going to say, Sally? You were, you were referring to this chart. What this chart says and tells us is that the polarization is not just in the people that have been elected to Congress. Mm -hmm. it's, it's in the congressional districts themselves. Mm -hmm and that that polarization is going to continue. Yeah. And okay. that is what we are, we are frustrated with, yeah. is that there's all this polarization in Congress, these people who say, I'm not gonna, ha I I'm not gonna put up a tax hike, or, and, and they, that's it. They get mm -hmm. others to sign on to it, and. Well, the, the net result is. They won't budge. They won't budge. The net, res the net result becomes a dysfunctional Congress. Nothing yes. gets done. Now, and what we not want considering <coughs> what's n what's necessary for the country. There we go. Just that's, that's right. they are considering what is only necessary for them to get reelected. Okay, so we have miles to go before we yes. turn off the show, mm -hmm. and so uh, mm -hmm. uh, Jeff, do you have a last word on this on this uh, issue? No, <laughs> Sally. No. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> my, my last word was, we have a, the net result is we have a dysfunctional Congress. That's true. No, we have a dysfunctional. <laughs> I, I tell we you. We have a dysfunctional Congress. Congress. That's a given. Dysfunctional. But we electorate. also have this. We also have a dysfunctional electorate. Electorate, electoral system, that is going to maintain a. A dysfunctional Congress. Okay, now I would like to come back and revisit this later because okay. I can tell that Sally, you've got some grit in your craw on this issue. <laughs> <laughs> and Jeff, I think that you have not begun to swear on this one. So, <laughs> okay. so we're going to come back later and we're going to talk about this on a future show. But uh, right now, um, we wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the fiscal cliff. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, Congressional yes. imposition. Uh, pie is good for you. Okay, what was <laughs> formerly known as Prince? No, what was formerly known as fiscal cliff. We are now calling the congressional imposition. So, uh, so um, we do have a roll in. That would be roll in number one. Do we have a Do we have a thumbs up from control room about number? Okay, we do have. So let's go to roll in number well, let me, one. Let me introduce this. Uh, quick. Hang Raymond, on just a second. Okay. Okay. Go. Basically, yeah. Bill Black contends that Obama is using the fiscal cliff as leverage against- The what? Congressional imposition, thank you. You got me. Keep it's going. It's gonna take a lot to keep Come me on. honest. Keep going. But anyways, uh, he's using this uh. as a weapon to get liberals and progressives to vote against their own best interest. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where uh, Bill Black begins his interviews. He answers that question. Is, okay. is Obama using the congressional imposition uh -huh. as a a weapon, and also the leading up to the so-called nuclear blast and whatever, if it falls apart. Oh no, apart. another one. Well, we gotta take <laughs> care of those guys. <laughs> so okay, so we have this, uh, this video that we wanna show you, and I want to tell the control room that both the count out, count down, and count up clocks are dysfunctional as Congress. Okay, so let's go to the roll-in. Okay, welcome back. Um, <clears throat> comment, Jeff? A lot of people don't know if Obama wants to use this uh, congressional imposition as a weapon or as a whatever to get people to vote against their own best interests, but it appears like that, and that's what Bill Black is saying. That's what if he walks like a duck and talks, talks like, like a duck. Talks like a duck, it's a duck. Okay. Um, and there's this whole idea, everybody wants to come to this grand bargain. Mm -hmm. 
why do we need a grand bargain? I guess because the grand bargain, basically, the way they're be the way they're pushing us, is they're pushing us to a grand bargain where we vote against our own best interest. We Na cut. Kind of sounds like Naomi Klein, shock, shock doctrine. doctrine, a crisis mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. to to mm -hmm. make people uh, accept uh, things they wouldn't normally do. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> now, one issue that's important to me and important to you, should be, and important to you too, is, uh, for instance, Social Security and mucking about with Social Security. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that uh, maybe some of our viewers might think that that's for old people, it's for everyone. And so mm -hmm. if, if I'm concerned about Social Security, I'm con I am definitely concerned about myself, but I'm concerned about the younger generations. And I think that there's an effort being made to, to separate the generations so that they, you know, to separate the older from the younger by telling the older people, we will not mess with your social security, don't worry, and leaving the younger generations out to dry. And I think this is uh, a, an awful situation. And we, as, as, voting, as voting Americans uh, and as activist Americans, we need to realize that we are one people and that this is something we need to fight together. Mm -hmm. I have a roll in with a woman uh, that was talking on Democracy Now! about this issue, a very short uh, uh, two minute clip. So if we could go to clip Good. number two, please. It's not a great deal. Um, I think one of the big problems with it is that it asks the middle class and the poor to pay for deficits that they had no hand in creating. Um, Seventy-seven percent of all households are going to be paying more on this deal, an average of sixteen hundred and thirty-five dollars a year. So that's the first point. It's a deal that as President Obama just said, asks everyone to pay. But that in itself, I think, is a problem, because it's the, the top percent that, that has uh, benefited from the tax cuts of the Bush era, that drove the economy into a recession, and which re is responsible for part of the deficit. And, of course, it's a, you know, a small segment of the uh, political class, really, that uh, dragged us into war in Iraq and Afghanistan, and that's another big part of the deficit. So uh, the cost is falling on the wrong group, in my opinion. Um, Social Security is not part of the problem of the deficit. It's, it's, a, it's a, a fiscally solvent program. It's solvent until 2030. Um, we shouldn't be talking about Social Security at, Social Security at all. Medicare, of course, is another story. Um, but on the other hand, maybe we should be waiting to see what happens with the health care program and how that plays out in terms of costs um, before we make dramatic changes to a program that people are, by and large, very satisfied with. Um, we need to be talking about other things, things that are not in the conversation right now, and that um, we also need to be talking about cutting those uh, military expenditures a lot more. I think one of the reasons that the Dem my feeling is the Democrats are not going to get a good deal 60 days from now is that Republicans know they don't have much of a spine for cutting military spending. Hi, I'm Naomi Klein, author of The Shock Doctrine, and you are watching TV Set, aiding and abetting the progressive community since 1991. Okay, welcome back. Uh, TV Set, as uh, Naomi said, aiding and abetting the progressive community since 1991. I'm Jim Rathel, Jeff Gerritsen, co-host, Sally Steepath, Dr. Sally, St Sally Steepath, co-host. We're here to talk to you. And uh, any comments on this uh, on this clip at all? I I totally agree with her. All right. Okay. We should not be. It should not even be on the table. My youngest son has schizophrenia. He's on Social Security disability income. You know, it it works because my wife and I tried to meet his needs, his psychiatric needs, his fiscal needs, uh, fin our financial needs and other needs, and by the time he was age 20, it just about broke us. Yeah. It's, you know, we needed help, and Social Security was there when we needed help. Yeah, yeah. Um, but e even more so, why is it that people want to make the middle class and the lower classes pay so the rich 
the one percent, the top tenth of a one percent, can extract and have the benefit of the wealth. Oh, it's so easy. It's because the con Congress is composed of millionaires. If it's it because was because Congress is funded and their campaigns are funded by those corporate interests that are making the millions. That, that's an excellent point. Um, <clears throat> but if Congress was actually a mirror of the population in terms of gender, so that would mean half women mm -hmm. half to start women. with, right. and whatever, uh, you know, I, 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 one I don't know. One third the, black, I don't know, one third. Hispanic. Hispanic. Mm -hmm. Don't forget. Whatever. Don't forget. Don't forget the Oriental, something. That's right. That, you know, but. I don't know exactly what the percentages the are. The rich and the poor. I mean, right. then we would have something that would, I think, that right. would resemble fairness. But uh, how about my pet crusade, which is banning all political contributions? All elections are publicly financed or funded. Three billion dollars on this thing that just happened was just awful. I mean. Uh, it could have been put to so much better use, and it didn't. It didn't help us in any way choose a better candidate. No, not in any way. Right. And there should there should be national outrage about this. There really should. And I've t you know I have tried to talk to people on the street about this issue, and it's not it's not a, a sexy issue. And somehow mm. we need we need some some way to frame it so that uh, there's so national that, apathy. Well, there sure is that. I don't think people really see that that I, I I don't think they see that they have any power over it, and I think that they see that okay these adverts are on TV and they cost so much money and of course they cost so much money and and they just they they go along with the status quo. No, you we are actually on our theme. Uh -huh. We're now we're we're, uh -huh. we're on the theme here, uh, which has to do with with motivation, popular motivation to get involved mm -hmm. and to to uh, yes. in South America they call it a luta, mm -hmm. in, in in Brazil, which means a struggle. You know so that some that an individual uh, takes up part of of a greater struggle to try and make a better world, mm -hmm. and 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 other uh, in the Spanish speaking it's called lucha, and uh, it means the same thing. And we don't even have a word for it. Or we, we, have, we have activists, you know, but uh, mm. you, in polite company, if you tell somebody you're an activist, they'll go, well, uh, I'm sorry to hear about that, or whatever. Yeah, my condolences or something. You know. Yeah, so, so how, how do we keep going? That's, that's a question that we wanna, we wanna talk about. Um, okay, well, we have a Roland. Uh, uh, do you, are you ready for, for Roland? Either of you have any more to say about this at no. this point? Yeah. Okay, you want to set up this uh, the Roland number one here? With oh wait, wait, wait we, we, well, we, we need a break. Number one, we do Roland need a break. Uh, so uh, Roland number three, if we could please, it's a, a Fury. Whoa. One. <laughs> Whoa. Condolence are in chief. Fiori does it again. Now, I thought these were dark. <laughs> that was really dark. That was really dark. It's, it's about saying sorry and not, nothing changes. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. in other countries, mm -hmm. death happens, mm -hmm. you know, there's a reaction and to it. there's a reaction to it and the laws change mm -hmm. and in other countries the laws have changed to limit mm -hmm. these you know uh, semi-automatic and automatic weapons yep. and access to the, the those cartridges where you can kill a hundred mm -hmm. people in a hundred minutes <sighs> And in our country, because we have a powerful lobby for the NRA and the guns. That's financed by the gun industry. And mm -hmm. 
We have somebody who's, who's now campaigning that there should be a, a teacher or teachers who have guns in, in the schools, in each and every school. More, more guns is not an answer. It's not an answer. And we have, we already are overpopulated with guns. More guns is not an answer. We have over 300 million guns in this country. Yes. Um, we already have too many guns. Too many guns. And it's going to be a very difficult battle to limit their, or whatever. We can reinstitute the assault weapons ban, mm -hmm. uh, put it back on. I would go for a little more restriction. I would say if you want to purchase a, a firearm, fine. You have to submit to a driving test, an evaluation, competency check, much like you would have to for a concealed carry permit, and it expires every four years. There have been ammunition tax, so for victims of gun violence. Those are things we can do now. But the guns, the gun used in Connecticut was, did not belong to this Mm -hmm. man. Mm -hmm. It belonged to his mother whom he killed. Mm -hmm. He got a hold of it so it was not mm -hmm. wow. so she would would have been the one licensed mm -hmm. to have the semi-automatic so, weapon. So your, your, your strategy mm -mm. and the things that you just said wouldn't have, wouldn't have prevented that. It wouldn't have prevented that. But basically would have made no difference at all. But basically he stole it. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. But he knew it was there. It mm -hmm. was his mother's weapon. He knew it was there, and he stole it and murdered his mother with it. Plus 20, mm -hmm. mostly children. Yeah, I'm just saying that there's, you've got a real issue because the minute you start instituting bans, everybody crimes, screams foul, and they whatever. There is no reason for anyone to have an automatic or a semi-automatic weapon or to have those cartridges of bullets. There's no reason. And I know there's <laughs> tons of them out there. And, mm -hmm. and, and after this event happened, they sold out three-year yes. supply yes. of high-capacity clips. clips. I mean, and, uh, right, because Obama people is, think it, they it, will not be able it, to buy them anymore. Obama mm -hmm. is correct that, that we do have to change. Mm -hmm. He is absolutely correct in that. Yes. He, of course, he hasn't quite sketched out how, mm -hmm. but but he's definitely correct in that. I mean, this this is truly, uh, if if this isn't the one, if this isn't the one that causes change, I mean, it's going to be it's going to be pretty soon because this is really this is pretty awful, pretty well, disgusting. Going back to the Nate Silver's article, mm. we may be so polarized that nothing gets done. Oh, That'll be the true tragedy. Good 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 callback. That, that, that is, would be the true tragedy. Nothing is done. Yeah, yeah. If Congress is so polarized in to, in action, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. would that would mean that we maybe need a new government. That and that that may be where mm -hmm. we're at. Okay, which would be um, a good topic for another show. All mm -hmm. right. So we do have we have to keep going here. <laughs> I'm I'm the, the the keeper of the uh, of the, the clock. clock. Okay. So I'm going to keep lashing you guys on. We have mm -hmm. another roll in. Uh, uh, please uh, intro intro roll in number okay. four. Um, I've I've often struggled. I mean, w just what we're talking about here, trying to get something done. You you see the corruptness of. I mean, we talked about our corruptness of our political campaigns. We've got elected officials who don't give a damn about us. But they're just out there for their money so they can get reelected. Re getting reelected is their number one priority. Um, you've got corporations that are just running roughshod over, like uh, over everybody in the government. I'll give you an example: ExxonMobil. They dictate to the government what would the, what will happen during the recent congressional imposition process. Uh, this so-called deal to avert this catastrophe, so to speak. Um, all the major corporations got all their benefits. They got all the tax breaks, and the rich got, if you're over what, 400,000 a year, you pay a few extra percent. The, I think the inheritance estate tax, I call it the rich brat tax, went up from 35% to 40%, but the exclusion went from $1 million to $5 million. And after a while, you just get frustrated, and you go, is it worth it? I mean, you just, 
it's on, it seems like every place you turn, you're getting hammered. And you try to tell people, and it's like you were saying, they don't care. It's like the, the great apathy. They just, what can I do? What would you say, Sally? Uh, it's learned that. helplessness. People think they can't make a difference, that they cannot, that their vote doesn't count, and that they mm -hmm. cannot make a difference even if they stand up, at, you know, mm -hmm. on an issue. Mm -hmm. Here's what I think. <clears throat> I think that, that uh, when a person is, is in that kind of state, th they are in danger, it could happen, of becoming uh, completely passive to the injustice that they see in front mm -hmm. of them. I mean, that, so there's a danger in that. Yes. And, um, and I, I, uh, I really think that the, the cure for that, that the, the cure for that weight of helplessness is being active. Voting yes. doesn't do it. Yes. Being active. Mm -hmm. And whatever wh whatever yeah. form that is. And um, uh, and it can be marching in the street, it can be writing letters, it can be doing a TV show mm -hmm. like we're doing. There, there are mm -hmm. many faces that it can take. And that if you still have that, that feeling of helplessness, if you have that feeling of helplessness, it means uh, to me, that that something is telling you you're not actively enough. You're you're not vitally connected to to the change. You're not. Your shoulder is close to, but not quite on the wheel yet. <laughs> well, <laughs> when you get out and march with other like-minded people, it's exhilarating. It's you. You go. Oh, there's other people who believe the way I do. My friends are here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yep. So. This Roland is talking about mm. another example uh -huh. of corporations running roughshod. Okay. Over well, let's it. hear it. So let's go ahead and see it. Okay, Roland number, number four, four, please, if you will. It's absolutely imperative that we begin to understand what unfettered, unregulated capitalism does, the violence of that system, which is portrayed in all of the places that we visited it. These are sacrifice zones, areas uh, that have been destroyed for quarterly profit. Uh, and we're talking about environmentally destroyed, communities destroyed, human beings destroyed, families destroyed. Uh, and because there are no impediments left, these sacrifice zones are just going to spread outward. What do you mean there are no impediments left? There's no way to control uh, corporate power. Uh, the system has broken down. Uh, whether it's Democrat or Republican. And because of that, we've all become commodities, uh, just as the natural world has become a commodity that is being exploited until it is exhausted or it collapses. You call them sacrifice zones. Right. Explain what you mean by that. Well, they have, the, the individuals who live within those areas have no power. Uh, the political system is bought off, the judicial system is bought off, the law enforcement system serves the interests of power. They have been rendered powerless. Um, you see that in the coal fields of southern West Virginia. Now here, in terms of natural resources, is one of the richest areas of the United States, and yet these harbor the poorest pockets of, of community, the poorest communities in the United States, because those resources are extracted, uh, and, and that money is not funneled back into the communities that uh, uh, you know, that are sitting on top of or next to those resources. Not only that, but they're extracted in such a way that the communities themselves are destroyed. Quite literally, because you have uh, not only terrible problems with erosion, you know, because when they do mountaintop removal, they'll, they'll use these gigantic bulldozers to, to push off all the trees and then burn them. And when we flew over the Appalachians, and it's a terrifying experience because you realize only then do you realize how vast the devastation is. Just as when we were both in the war in Bosnia, you couldn't grasp the destruction of ethnic cleansing until you actually flew over Bosnia and village after village after village had been razed and destroyed. And the same was true in the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, and these people are poisoned. Uh, the water is poisoned, it smells, um, it, the, the soil is poisoned, and the people who are making tremendous profits from this, don't even live in 
in West Virginia. Yeah, I think you said something like, while the laws of West Virginia are written by the coal companies, 95% of those coal companies right. are not in West Virginia. That's right. But they no longer want to dig down for the coal, and so they're blowing the top 400 feet off of mountains, uh, poisoning the air, poisoning the soil, poisoning the water. Uh, they use uh, some of the largest machines on Earth, uh, these drag lines, 25 stories tall, uh, that are very efficient in terms of ripping out coal seams. Uh, but by the time they've left, uh, there's just a wasteland. Nothing grows. Some of the richest soil, uh, some of the purest water, and these are the headwaters for much of the East Coast. You, you are rendering the area moonscape. It becomes uninhabitable. And you're destroying, you know, these are the lungs of the eastern seaboard. It's all destroyed and it's not coming back. Mm. That was, uh, that was we have a lot of optimistic roll-ins, don't we, tonight? Well, yeah, that was hard to look at. It's and, hard um, to see. Yeah, yeah, boy. I, I, w I chose that, and I edited out that, to, and there, they list three other examples. But that shows just how devastated an area can become mm -hmm. when people don't get involved. Mm -hmm. The locals there did not stand up. They can't. They can't. They've been rendered powerless. And the corporations that went in there and destroyed the area have been so effective at reducing the powers of the state to control them that they run roughshod. And they have also been very effective in preventing other people from seeing what they've been doing. So are you suggesting that this could be a metaphor for the whole of the country? Yes, I am. That's Because this is what we've been talking about. Yes. The same thing. Yeah. And this yes. is something I've been wrestling with. You, you, you just, in that particular example in West Virginia, they were, that whole area, the whole region was so severely destroyed. Mm -hmm. And yet, um, the p very people that lived there were taken advantage. They were reduced to uh, in poverty. They were reduced to poverty. Mm -hmm. But, All their but let me take devil's advocate. That's West Virginia. Mm-hmm. Who's worried about West Virginia? We're not worried about West Virginia. We're on the West Coast. Mm -hmm. It won't be long before they're here. Look at, if you've been in Portland for 30 years, where did all the industry go? And also, where did all the old growth go? Where did the forest where did the go? Old where did the old growth mm -hmm. Old growth grow? And they, the are, they are digging, and I don't know if they're using mountaintop re removal, but they're digging coal in Montana, which mm -hmm. they're going to be shipping through Portland, yeah, Portland. to port to the yeah. port here. We need to talk and to shipping them. to China. We need mm -hmm. to get some uh, Sierra Club people on the show. We to, should to talk about that. Yes, because that's that's something that's local. So yes, that is local. Yeah. In the interest of time, how do we respond to that? How do you persevere? How do you move forward? Well, they are having marches. Mm -hmm. There are marches against the coal being uh, mm -hmm. shipped through Portland. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Sierra Club is crucial in leading that march. Mm -hmm. Jeff, we want to get you out on the street. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you're saying. Yes. yes. We want to get you out on the street, Jeff. Have yes. you ever been in a march? Mm -mm. Jeff. But I've been, but I've. He's a virgin. <laughs> <laughs> but I have been to local and congressional representatives and met with them. Well, that's good. That's good. But we, that's good. we want to do the whole mm -hmm. thing. We want to get mm -hmm. you out on the street. Yeah. In fact, um, is there a march coming up? Do you know of one? I don't know of one coming up. I have We're gonna a friend out. who feeds me marches. We're going to document so, this. Yes. And you're going to be there, and I'm going to be there, okay? okay? We will do this. We will bring it to you. Okay. And maybe we'll see you out okay. on the street also. So anyways, the next rolling is how Chris Hedges responded to that. Alrighty. Okay. So, okay. Do, uh, control room, roll in number five, please. Except for the power of the pen, you keep writing, you keep speaking, you keep agitating. I do, but it, you know things aren't getting better, and and I think uh, you know, like you, I come out of the seminary, and it, it, I I look less on my ability to affect change. Um, and understand it more as a kind of moral responsibility to resist um, these forces, which I think in theological terms are forces of death. 
uh, and to fight to protect, preserve, uh, and nurture life. Um, but, uh, you know, as my friend Father Daniel Berrigan says, you know, we're called to do the good, uh, or at least the good insofar as we can determine it, and then we have to let it go. Faith is the belief that it goes somewhere. Aren't we all, in a way, as complicit as those people looking down on you from those windows at Goldman Sachs? No, because, uh, you know, the people who actually run the commodities index are a very tiny, elite, and extremely wealthy group. Uh, and that personal enrichment, I think, is a powerful inducement to ignore their complicity in what is clearly a crime uh, against other human beings. But do you think what you did made any difference? Goldman Sachs hasn't changed. Well, that, that doesn't matter. I did what I had to do. I did what I believed I should have done. Um, and, and faith is a belief that it, that it does make a difference, even if all of the empirical signs around you point otherwise. But you're driven by something. Well, because when you spend that long on the outer reaches of empire, you understand the cruelty of empire, what Conrad calls the horror, the horror, and the lies that we tell ourselves about what is done in our name. And you seek um, to speak a very unpleasant truth about who we are, a truth that most people don't want to hear. Um, and yet, I think to hold that truth in and to remain silent and not to speak that truth uh, destroys you. What price do you think you've paid? I don't think I paid a price. I think I would have paid a price for staying in. I wouldn't have been able to live with myself. Um, you know, I was pushed out of the New York Times because I was publicly denouncing the invasion of Iraq. Do you think you can accomplish more as a dissenter? Yeah, I, it's not a question that I've asked. Um, it's the, because the question is, what, what do you have to do? Uh, and yet, you know, as Paul Tillich writes about, you know, institutions are always inherently demonic, uh, including the church. And, and that um, you cannot finally serve the interests of those institutions. That for those who seek the moral life, there will always come a time in which they have to defy even institutions they care about if they are to, able to retain that moral core. Your columns, your essays, your recent book, this book contain repeated calls for uprisings, for civil disobedience. You even say in here, quote, revolt is all we have. It is our only hope. Who are sitting there thinking, what is he asking me to do? What does he mean by revolt? What's he talking about? Nonviolent civil disobedience and accepting the fact that engaging in that process will mean arrest. I've lived in societies that are rent and torn by violence, and I don't want us to go there. Uh, and I think that we don't have a lot of time left. Uh, and that for those of us who care about veering off into another course, a course that's rational and sane, and uh, makes possible the perpetuation of not only the human species but the planet itself, um, we have to take this kind of radical action. And if we don't, then as things disintegrate uh, and as the paralysis within uh, the, the, the centers of power become more and more apparent, um, then we will fuel very frightening extremes, uh, you know, again, which I saw in places like Central America or Bosnia. I look at my youngest son. And in so many ways, I feel that I have to fight for them. Um, that even if I fail, they'll say, you know, at least my dad tried. Um, we've deeply betrayed this next generation on so many levels. And um, I can't argue, finally, you know, given the empirical facts in front of us, that hope is rational. Uh, and I retreat, like so many people in my book, into faith uh, and a, a, a belief that resistance and fighting for life is meaningful even if all of the outward signs around us deny that possibility. The faith in human beings? Faith in, in that fighting for the sanctity of life is always worth it. Uh, because, you know, if we don't fight, then we are finished. Then we've signed our own death sentence. Uh, and uh, Camus writes about this in The Rebel, that I think resistance becomes a kind of way of protecting our own 
worth as an individual, our own dignity, our own self-respect. Uh, and I think resistance does always leave open the possibility of change. And if we don't resist, um, then we've essentially extinguished that hope. Well, the guy was. So, what were you saying? <laughs> yes. You were saying about not having that hope, not having that overarching mm -hmm. principle. Mm hmm. I was saying that working through this mm -hmm. and having in preparing, doing the time to research this and preparing for this has shown me, kind of answered that question. And I felt it was important that a lot of people need to see that also. Because it's very discouraging when you, when you look at what we're having to deal with and you look at the corruption. Um, I mean, we don't have to put up with like what West Virginia did, we, but we got other issues of corruption in our local community. But nonetheless, it's the same process. It's the same thing that people do. You just get out there and you do it. Mm -hmm. And you do it because, well, faith, that it goes somewhere. But if you don't do anything, then you don't have any hope at all. And I'm quite serious about uh, getting you out on the mm -hmm. next demonstration that, that, uh, that, that happens on, on a local issue. And, uh, and it is a, a really an empowering experience. Um, um, my gal friend was very, um, uh, shy, mm -hmm. to say the least, about going out to do something like this. And I actually got her to go. And we were out there marching down the street I, on, on one of the anti-war rallies. And I said, well, what do you think? She says, this is really exhilarating. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're, you're with hundreds or whatever, thousands of yeah. people who agree yeah. mm -hmm. with, what you're, with what you're doing. So we're 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 down about yes. we're we're down to about two minutes now. So yes. Um, so um, I would I'll take my 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 shot at this. I really think that uh, <coughs> that uh, for me what works is the, is the the concept of luta or lucha, mm -hmm. and that 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 is a piece that I have declared is mine, and that I know that other people are struggling also. I may not know them personally; some I do know, but are struggling in in a similar direction. For a better world, and so that that works for me. The the faith thing doesn't work mm -hmm. for me so well. And what so I'd what I'd an example that I would like to put forth is the woman who started Mothers Against Drunk Driving. When she, she lost her little two year old girl to a drunk d driver, instead of going into this depression. I've lost my daughter, blah, blah, blah. There's nothing I can do. To memorialize her daughter, she took up her luta, her mm -hmm. battle, which was to change the drunk driving limits in every single state, and she has. She's Great. raised them in... I th it may be Great 48 job. out of 50 states, but what I'm saying is she's made a difference with drunk driving legislation just by taking up the, this, this battle. Jeff, you've got about 12 seconds. <laughs> Sorry. I can't say it any better than Sally just did. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and that's about what you have time for. Okay, control room. Obviously, we're going into international cartoon time right now. So, and we, we leave the, the volume levels up so we can discuss the cartoons. So this one is from Canada, uh, indicating that uh, when the, uh, what we were trying to avoid saying, fiscal cliff is resolved, next right down the road is debt ceiling. So there's going to be another, another one of these uh, fake dramas coming on. Down the, road. the term fake drama. Yeah. So here, here's one from Russia, and it shows Putin trying to take his, his picture. And when he, I don't quite get it, but when he mashes the button, a raw egg pops out of the camera and lands on the floor at his feet. <laughs> hmm. Spectacular. Yeah. This one is actually from Holland, and it's about India, and it's about the gang rape of Ooh. this poor woman who was on her way to uh, uh, training and was raped and died in India. Yeah, horrible, horrible situation. There's a bunch of women making a difference. Yeah. And uh, this one from Jordan, uh, indicating that uh, Putin is uh, ready to let go of uh, support for Assad, looks like. He's weighed his chances. 
Uh, this one from Canada. It may be a little hard to read, but there are a couple of Incas. One of them says, says uh, uh, I told you to wait till Christmas when we could really cash in on this thing, but no, you decided to go ahead and make it the end of the world before Christmas. And now they're trying to sell the calendar for 50% off. This one from France. Uh, the, the, uh, the subject here is family violence, and gosh, you just couldn't depict it any more forcefully than this cartoon, I don't think. This one, uh, I, I don't remember the country, but it shows Uncle Sam with this needle in his arm indicating that we are addicted to war. We are addicted to, uh, addicted to the military. It's and violence in general. And violence and guns, in general. that is a gun. Yeah, mm -hmm. syringe, yeah, exactly. Syringe. Yeah. This is from Romania, uh, 2013, and all these people like standing and looking <laughs> in horror at this innocent new year. Oh, was, wasn't that Van Gogh's? Was that, yes. that's from no, it's not Van Gogh. No, no. It, was it, was a, it, was, it was another guy. That was guy. the scream. The yeah. scream, yeah. Right, not Van Gogh. Uh, this one from Australia, showing the fis fiscal cliff, and it says, uh, it's all downhill it's all from all here. All downhill from here. <laughs> Uh, might be true. Uh, this is from Mexico, showing a woman putting a coin into a chicken so that it can lay an egg in her skillet. Uh, it's a beautiful cartoon. It's just so phenomenally well rendered. And uh, I, I just... Reading poverty. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, this one, Resolution 2013, the year I quit smoking. The gun smoking, yeah. Well, let's... let's Let's hope that this is true. Uh, this one from Bulgaria, um, showing the, the donkey and the elephant falling into probably a cesspool <laughs> from the fiscal cliff thing. Uncle Sam says, going well. Going well. Hmm. <laughs> Curious, sir. This one from Cuba is a, is a takeoff on the, uh, the his master's voice. It looks like the dog left a little, little present little behind. Present, yes. <laughs> and this one from the Philippines uh, showing uh, attempts at gun control. They just keep sawing off the barrel, making it shorter and shorter, but it's still a deadly weapon all the way down. And it gets more unpredictable as you keep cutting it. Mm. Mm. <clears throat> this one from Germany showing Obama wrestling boner. Boehner, boner. Boehner, boner. boner. Off the cliff, uh, hanging off the cliff there. Uh, yeah, Mr. Boner is not doing too well. Yeah. This one from Jordan, I don't know exactly, but there's a, a Satan with a 20, 50, uh, 12, 13, 14, 14 15, 15 thing. I don't know exactly what it is, but it's an, an amazing image. And that's it. See you in two weeks. Thank you for joining us. Oh, wait, wait. Watch this, this is so cool.